Thank you. Thanks very much for coming. Um, I've never been introduced as a theorist before. That's a new one. Um, I've approached this talk in the same way that I approach my creative practice. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. What I thought I might do, for those of you, um, some people know about this because of the emails which Andy sent out, and some people know about it because of the emails which I sent out through the free range emailing list. So I'll just read you um, the questions which I claim to be addressing in this talk so that we're all kind of on the same page. Um, this is the blurb that Andy sent out. I was pleased to be invited to give a performance lecture as part of this series, which I really was. Um, but on reflection, I wondered whether I should have accepted the invitation. And the reason for this is that I'm a sessional academic and an instrumental tutor here at Christchurch. And since I've um, finished my PhD in 2013, I've kind of got out of the habit of thinking of what I do as research. For six years, I did my PhD and I developed the habit of thinking of what I do as research. I'll investigate what I mean by that in a little while. Um, I do continue to document the development of my practice. So I record and I um, have books full of manuscript pads with ideas and interrogate the scaffolding procedures and values that support it. Well, I don't have any money supporting me, so I need to, uh, need to, uh, I'm often asking why, why am I doing what I'm doing? Uh, and in some ways, my creative practice could be considered to be the result of thinking what I do as research. I don't think I would do what I'm going to be doing for you this evening had I not spent six years thinking of it as research. And yet, would you consider your creative practice as research if there were no incentive to do so? And what does it do to your practice to think of it as research? What does it mean to cultivate creative practices as part of university life, especially practice such as improvising music, uh, or perhaps improvised dance that leave behind no text. Um, and what impact do the priorities of the REF have on the development of the creative practice of both contracted members of staff and academics on zero hours contracts? So there's some technical language in there, as I see some undergraduates here. Um, the REF means Research Excellence Framework, and every four years, higher education institutions, each department submits a portfolio of work of research done by their members. And that research is uh, essentially peer-reviewed, I mean, do correct me if I'm wrong, and then um, rated, and um, are kind of nationally rated. And it affects the decisions of governments and other grant awarding bodies as to which, how much money higher education get, higher education institutions get. And, um, and in the free range email, I, I uh, mentioned two other questions. I, would, I said that I would, I would look at the difference between creative practice and research and what is the purpose of incorporating artistic practice into academia. So they're the same kind of questions. Um, so I need to get, we need to get clear on a couple of concepts before we can start the discussion. The first is, what is creative practice? Um, I'm hoping most of you understand roughly what it is. But I mean, my creative practice that I'm presenting today is playing the piano and playing the piano with um, what's called preparations, which means doing things that change the sound of the piano. And um, why do I do this? Um, to surprise myself, I think. I've been playing the piano for 20 years, more than 20 years, and um, these preparations uh, reinvent the experience for me, kind of reinvigorate the experience for me. Um, so are you all clear on creative practice, what creative practice is? This is the Centre for Practice-Based Research and creative practice is uh, a, a crucial thread of what we call practice-based research in university. So then what is research? I, when I was a PhD student I got very, very bogged down with this question, but um, the, uh, the Research Excellence Framework has a really fantastic, pithy definition of research. It's, uh, they define it as a process of investigation leading to new insights effectively shared. A process of investigation leading to new insights effectively shared. So that kind of manages to sum up the three areas that the REF focus on, which is um, outputs, like what is the, the product of your research, impact, uh, what's the reach and the, uh, what effect does your research have, and environment, which is how does it contribute to um, your field in general or the cultural life in, in that field. So 
Um, previous definitions of, of research for the, through the research excellence framework include things like original investigation taken in order to gain knowledge and understanding. And what's interesting about the REF is I've been um, working at university now for about four, 13 years. And so I've been able to see a developing, a developing sophistication of um, assessment, uh, the ability of higher education to assess practice, essentially. Um, and the last research excellence framework, each, each four years, I think they build on their practice and they refine uh, what they're doing and their assessment criteria based on the kind of things which come in. Um, it's worthwhile mentioning perhaps some of the things which could constitute outputs because um, it's very varied. So this is um, this is within the kind of uh, practice-based research assessment criteria. You could have books, chapters and books, journal articles, working papers. Uh, you could have um, digital and broadcast media, performances, other live types of live presentation, artefacts, designs, exhibitions, films, video, software, um, creation of archives. All of these things constitute research, and some of them are, are clearly uh, creative practice. Okay, so... That's creative practice, and this is research. The other question that's worth clearing up is, uh, why? what's the purpose of incorporating artistic practices into academia? Now, each of these questions could very easily spill into a massive, great big thesis. And um, I should say at this point um, that I have approached this talk in the same way that I approach my practice, in, by which I mean I have accumulated a whole load of half-formed ideas that I find interesting. And rather than working them out in paper uh, or working them out through practice, I work them out through performance, through doing them. Um, this is, works OK in the musical world, and I haven't yet tried it in the uh, conference world. Normally, when I've done conferences, I've been very fully prepared. And of course, my PhD was, was, was very, very um, worked through. So I'm dealing with topics of which I'm not an expert and which you may, be, may have more expertise on. Um, so please pick me up on that in the question and answer session if you want. Uh, and I'm dealing with ideas which I have um, mulled over but not fully processed. So what's the purpose of incorporating artistic practice into academia? Well, um, practice-based research, thinking about practice-based research is probably more advanced uh, in the visual arts. Or at least uh, traditionally, the visual arts, I think, started grappling with the conceptual issues around this before music and before other um, practice-based disciplines. Um, there's a man called Henk Borgdorf, who's professor of art theory at the Amsterdam School of Art, and he's written very cogently on the subject. He says that art practice, both the art object and the creative process, embodies situated tacit knowledge that can be revealed and articulated by means of experimentation and interpretation. Uh, what's that mean? Um, my feeling of why the why um, artistic practice is valuable in the academia is is simple. Um, there was a crisis of confidence in um, rationalist post enlightenment thought in the middle of the nineteenth century, and I think we are seeing the evolution of the university as it uh, accepts as it has to that there are way more forms of knowledge than are traditionally modelled in uh, you know conventional scientific research paradigm. This has been known about for 100, 150 years, and the knowledge communicated through performance, through music... What was I thinking of earlier? Um, there's all sorts of knowledges which are inadequately catered for uh, by the conventional research paradigm. So, I mean, I could go on and on. I, hope not, I don't want to bore you, but um, there are forms of knowledge which are non-verbal, which are absolutely essential to our daily lives. And I think it's fantastic that higher education institutions are becoming receptive to these forms of knowledge. Uh, it's long overdue. Um, and it is part of much wider kind of conceptual and cultural movements as well. So what is the difference between creative practice and research? Now, this is really crucial. Um, it's crucial for, for several reasons, and they'll come become clear. Um, Borgdorf, again, he talks about what qualifies practice as research. And this is a definition he came to in 2006, so it's a, it's a little dated in terms of the thinking about this, but it seems to fulfil its function. Art practice qualifies as research 
if its purpose is to expand our knowledge and understanding by conducting an original investigation in and through art objects and creative processes. Art research begins by addressing questions that are pertinent in the research context and in the art world. Researchers employ experimental and hermeneutic methods that reveal and articulate a tacit knowledge that is situated and embodied in specific artworks and artistic processes. Research processes and outcomes are documented and disseminated in an appropriate manner. Blah, 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 blah. The, um, the bottom line is um, that, that well, he, he talks about research questions. That's really interesting. When I was um, writing the application form to my PhD studentship, I came up against questions which I still haven't found a satisfactory answer for about eight years on. And um, I got very uh, bogged down with them. And the questions were essentially, I had to write a research question and I wanted to do a practice-based PhD. How could I write a research question in the medium of language that could be answered primarily through the medium of music? I've, if you've got an answer to that, tell me. In the end, my supervisor said to me um, that in his experience, people made art, made work, and then framed it as research afterwards. Um, and that wasn't enough for me. I thought, well, why do it in the context of university then? Why do it under the whole rigmarole of a PhD if you're not going to ask research questions and then answer them through your practice? If you're just going to do your practice and then call it research afterwards, what's the point? Well, the point is, is largely economic, which I'll come to. Um, so clearly, if it's not intended as research, it doesn't count as a search, at least according to Borgdorf here. Um, the people making work, uh, either PhD students or, or uh, academics in universities, will be on a salary, or uh, as I was, a studentship. I got uh, something in the region of £12,000 a year for three years to, to do the PhD. It's fantastic. And um, their salaries will be at least partly dependent on them being research active. Um, so, yeah, as, a, as an academic, you're employed to, uh, to both teach and to produce research. So if you don't produce research, your job then becomes insecure. Um, so looked at this way, there is not a huge difference between um, practice-based artist researchers and artists work in the commercial world they're both subject to market forces or that rather not rather market forces the way I've uh, um, worded it here and I need to be careful about my wording both academics and commercial artists have to negotiate a relationship between their creative practice and the economic structures that support it um, in simplistic terms the artists working in the marketplace is answerable to the consumers of their product so it's a fairly clear clear-cut kind of view of things. And it's very simplistic, but it's largely true. You might assume that artists working in universities are, are answerable to their academic communities, but that's not true. Um, artists, researchers, are usually active outside of the university, and that's usually considered to be a criteria of their effectiveness as researchers, the, of their prowess as researchers. Um, their reputation and their status as researchers is dependent on their um, status in the field to a certain extent. Um, and I would speculate uh, that many artist researchers consider their, their, their most valuable artistic experiences to often happen outside of the university and outside the academy. Um, I wonder if there's that many, um, how many scientists or physicists would have a similar view. Um, it almost, you, almost, you, you could even um, suggest that it, within the arts, sometimes a degree of fetishism develops amongst academics about the imagined reality of a genuine artistic field independent of the priorities of artistic life that exists outside. Of course, that's a fiction. But um, it, it, within the constraints of university life, you might kind of imagine, oh, I wish I was just free to do art. Um, so when you're trying to think about the difference between creative practice and research, um, economy comes into it and money where's the money um, one thing I found really interesting and quite hard to get my head around as a, as a PhD student is the um, is that there's no real equivalent to peer-based research peer peer um, peer-reviewed research um, when it comes to public disseminating artwork 
So for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, peer, peer review is the process of, um, in many academic disciplines, you submit an article to a journal and it will be anonymously peer reviewed, which means that experts who don't know you and you don't know them will check out your work and see whether it's worthwhile um, publicising to the, to the journals. Now, there is a very rigorous peer review system for the REF for practice-based research, and I spent hours last week reading through um, quite a detailed assessment criteria, and I, I was really heartened to see how sophisticated the assessment criteria for, for that had become. But in terms of public disseminating practice-based research, it's still in the field, which is outside the academy, non-peer reviewed. And um, therefore, it's very different from the way that other research is disseminated. Um, some people have argued uh, that there's a community of practitioners which constitute uh, you know, an equivalent peer review process. Um, but in my experience, that is uh, very rarely as rigorous as an anonymous peer review process. So I still think that there's a, a disparity there. Um, the other thing is that in the, in the world of the arts, uh, there is still a very strong emphasis on personality and the cult of the personality carries a lot of weight in the arts. And um, So if you think about the notion of reputation as being important for a practice-based researcher in the academy, you think, well, what does, what does a rep reputation attach to? Does it attach to the research or to the researcher? And in, in, in a, a, an artistic field obsessed with the cult of personality like acting or music or drama or... Um, or the art world, the fine art world, the reputation will attach obviously to the researcher. And their research will be a means of enhancing their individual reputation. Um, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that this doesn't happen in any other academic fields, but I'm saying that the cult of personality, which is uh, such a strong, prevalent trait of, of the cultural fields, really does exacerbate this situation. So if you're talking about commissions or exhibitions or media coverage or favourable reviews or bookings for performances, um, these happen through word of mouth recommendation or who you know or how the commission might help the career of particular organisations. These are kind of... Um, um, there's all sorts of ways in which these things come about. And I realise that this happens in all sorts of uh, fields. But the absence of a rigorous peer review process and the personality cults that shape the marketplace in many artistic disciplines contribute to a situation where it's possible to conceive of an artist with a reputation that's better than their work. And I would argue that this happens less in other academic disciplines. And the peer review process is the reason that it happens less. The bottom line is basically that qu the quality of practice based research is harder to assess objectively than um, many other times of research. Um, in, again, in the fine art world, especially I think in the mid-noughties when there was probably there was, seemed to be an influx into university life of artists who made their name in the nineties through um, through conceptual work, and Biggs gets uh, this guy Ian Biggs who, who's in um, gets quite hot under the collar. He says, in such a context, the authority of art staff without a doctoral degree can appear to be based on nothing more than ill-defined concept of reputation, derived from a complex of diverse spheres of activity and values that are uncertainly located, fall outside the methodologies of academic scrutiny, and are part of a notoriously fickle culture industry, increasingly wedded to celebrity culture. In short, the authority of art staff without a doctoral degree can appear to stem from a highly subjective value judgments made by a small self-perpetuating group of their peers. And when you consider the relationship between reputation in the field, um, um, when you consider the impact of market forces on uh, practice-based researchers in, acad in academia, it makes you... Um, when I was, uh, before I became a PhD student, I imagined academia as this kind of ivory tower where pure research happened. Um, and of course that's an ideal, but it is one of the ideals that universities were set up to preserve. Um, and the idea of a reputational experience in the field, the expectation for work to demonstrate impact outside of the academy, that's actually a, 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 a criteria of assessment in the REF, the work needs to demonstrate impact outside the academy, and the focus on personality in the cultural industries 
combined to make this the relationship between creative practice that takes place inside and outside the universities um, complex and difficult. There's also um, the issue of the amount of time it takes for an idea to be disseminated. I was reading about Walt Whitman and Ezra Pound, the poets, neither of whom made it a living by writing poetry. Of course, they're primarily known as poets now. Walt Whitman's not known as a, a journalist or a printer. Is it too much to expect immediate impact from practice-based research? Is there a danger that financially supporting creative, creative practice capable of demonstrating immediate impact will perpetuate conservative, mediocre art? Traditionally in Western culture, artists have been the gatekeepers of spokespeople for or the press events for the sublimated irrational urges of society. Maybe their being accepted into university means that we're a much more liberated and happy society. We don't need artists anymore. Or perhaps society is reacting to the threat posed by artists by attempting to dilute their potency by assimilating them into either the marketplace or academia. Capitalism is notorious for absorbing dissenting voices. Is the similar thing happening with the university? Of course, universities aren't aiming to observe all, uh, absorb all artistic activity, but the stable level of funding they provide for artist researchers in the form of salaries and research grants certainly presents the possibility that, the possibility that they will absorb many artists. A little like Private schools often soak up some of the best educational resources in an area. in a second. One of the things that I aim for in a performance, as I said, is work being done through the performance. This is, um, you could describe this as very sloppy and careless uh, scholarship. I don't prepare or fully think through my ideas before I execute them. But this is a deliberate methodology. What I'm aiming for is uh, the sense of something coming into being or being negotiated or worked through that the performance involves bearing witness to or participating in some form of creation, even some form of healing, transformation or revelation. Jacques Attali recognises such traces of religious or spiritual significance in musical performance. He says, musician, priest and officiant were in fact a single function amongst ancient peoples. Shaman, doctor, musician. He is one of society's first gazers upon itself. And one of the things which struck me over the course of my research is how many improvisations, uh, improvising musicians fulfill a shaman-like role. I particularly got this um, from listening to Evan Parker's uh, solo performances. Um, 
Evan Parker appears to willfully enter a trance state in order to draw on otherwise inaccessible creative resources. <clears throat> Professor Michael Tucker, who's one of the few academics to have done quite detailed research on shamanism, um, he describes the traditional role of the shaman. And for me, it touches on what an improvising musician might, in theory, be capable of. So these are Tucker's words. The great service of the shaman has always been to help shake people out of the rut of experience, out of the sheer forgetfulness of mystery and awe which so often infects everyday life. The essence of mystical experience has always been to free the soul from the premature death of routine, of habit, of boredom, that one comes to know the world anew. It was for this purpose that shamans entered a trance, and they were drummed into the dancing ecstasy. They required a secret language, performed a dance. Only one of these is essential, however. The work of art is a 
survive without the market, but where there is no gift, there is no art. Art that matters to us is received by us as a gift. Religions often prohibit the sale of sacred objects, the implication being that their sanctity is lost if they are bought and sold. Imagine if a priest charge entrance to their sermons. A work of art seems to be a hardier breed. It can be bought and sold in the market and still emerge as a work of art. But if it's true that in the essential commerce of art, a gift is carried by the work from the artist to his audience, if I'm right to say that where there is no gift, there is no art, then it may be possible to destroy a work of art by converting it into a pure commodity. The giving of gifts tends to establish a relationship between the parties involved. Furthermore, when gifts circulate within a group, their commerce leaves a series of interconnected relationships in its wake and a kind of decentralised cohesiveness emerged. It's this element of relationship which leads me to speak of gift exchange as an erotic commerce, opposing eros, the principle of attraction, union, involvement, which binds together to logos, reason and logic in general, the principle of differentiation in, in, in particular. A market economy is an emanation of logos. Clearly, a university is an emanation of Logos as well. Um, I was going to finish with a quote by Pablo Neruda, but I won't, because I'm really interested in hearing your ideas. Thank you very much.